very much. Just a quick intro. Today's session we're looking at winning new clients and building alternative revenue streams for business. Really prudent timing as uh, Kevin was just talking about the changes in the global economy, hopefully the uplift in the UK market. What are you going to be doing to separate yourself from your competition? Uh, just a quick caveat. Yes, we did run uh, or some of the sessions have over on slightly. Your lunch is still going to be waiting for you. There's no challenge there. No one's eating it on your behalf. I think the other sessions are going to overrun a little bit as well. So, just a quick intro to myself. I'm founding director of Console Partners. So, Console Partners is a niche technology recruitment firm. Founded in 2008, we've grown to over 50 staff. 10 million turnover this year, and actually we're in the, in the Sunday Times Fast Track Top 100 as uh, one of the fastest growing recruiters, 110% year on year growth for four years running. Got a strong focus on the UK and international markets, we've made placements in 39 countries, got an enviable client list. Just on a side note, I'm also a Dale Carnegie trainer, so do a lot of sales training, sales strategy, business development. But enough about me, let's just jump straight into it. So. Some of the contents we're going to cover. I'm going to touch on the state of the industry. The importance of your market and why you're working your market. How we're going to go about developing a winning business development strategy and how we actually uncover those hot markets. The concept of building new revenue streams is alien to some companies and therefore we're going to introduce some ideas around that and specifically develop solutions for your business. It is an interactive session. I will ask you questions. We will break out into groups at some stage. So your participation in the future of your business is critical at this stage. Let's take a look at this. UK recruitment industry shrunk by nearly 30% since 2007. In fact, Kevin told me a stat I didn't know today. In the past year alone, 11% of recruitment companies have either closed, sold, acquisition. That's staggering. That's a staggering attack on our business. Now when you think about our business has grown relentlessly, year on year, for 20 years running, to decline by 30% is a big challenge. But yet we've seen some companies in that time grow rapidly year on year, seemingly oblivious to the global economic meltdown. How are they able to grow? The economy is in the worst condition for 50 years. In fact, let me throw this out there as a question to, 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 the, audience, sorry, to the room here. How have some of these companies grown? Any ideas? Differentiate themselves in the market. Yes, good one. Some Lucky companies. Enough to be in uh, booming markets. Yes, yeah, so there's twofold, twofold there. Some companies were able to differentiate themselves throughout that process and therefore continue to win new business. Likewise, you said, I think, booming markets. Some companies were working hot markets that, if anything, continue to grow during the economy. I think Kevin touched on that. Any other ideas? So yes, so I think we're talking about the, uh, we're looking at generalists to being niche. Yes, the last five years have seen a rise in niche recruiters and therefore many of the niche recruits had a natural advantage in making sure they grew because their tiny area hopefully was well selected and growing. I've got some critical points here that we looked at. Recruit industry today, the companies that have achieved this record number of growth have had a major emphasis on training. Because by upskilling their staff to stay ahead of their competition, they were able to make sure they either increase net fee income per consultant or maintain that. Either way, they were able to stay ahead of the declining curve. Some of the companies had a big emphasis on staff retention. Naturally, I think uh, Kevin touched on this element of retaining your core talent, because that way you're going to get a greater return per head. Some companies were, were fortunate that their key customers weren't affected. Or likewise, that they're actually able to win a major staffing project that actually brought in new or additional revenue for them. Some of them were able to tie up long-term deals. So some of the companies that had major contract um, books with two-year contracts or RPO deals were able to safeguard themselves. But most importantly, the number one reason the companies have been able to expand over the last five years is they had a BD strategy, a business development, a business strategy that kept that targeted the right markets at the right time. Absolutely critical, right markets, right time. You can have a top level recruiter, the best recruiter we've ever seen as an individual, work in a declining market and they will struggle. Likewise, you can have an average recruiter work in a hot market, expanding market, and they should do pretty well. 
That's what we're going to be looking at today. The importance of market strategy. Most recruiters tend to work historic markets that are tried and trusted. Let's think about this. Most recruiters actually, myself included, I was a recruiter, progressed through the ranks, set up my own recruitment company. When we set, first set up Consult Partners, one of the first markets we did was what we worked on, my business partner and I, we were working communications, technology recruitment. That's what we've been doing for 10 years. Ironically, we set up a company based on something that we were doing 10 years ago. We had a focus, or most businesses have a focus on pitching, account management, objection handling, negotiating fees. Who are you going to call? How many calls are you making? How many call hours? Actually, it might be the strategy itself that's under attack. It might be the markets that we're looking at that we need to look at in detail. One of the facts is, we tend to work yesterday's markets. I.e., these are markets that were big maybe when we first set up the company. Some of us are even smart enough that we're working markets today, i.e. they're on vogue, all the buzzwords are out there. How many of us are working future markets? If you think of the logic of your business, it's actually about growth and hiring. Therefore, if you think about markets that are going to be big in two, three, four years' time, that's where the growth is today. And the irony of it, we rarely think about that fu the future of our market and getting ahead of the curve. So as the economy evolved, many companies didn't change and review what they were doing. They carried on doing it. They looked at their training strategy, they looked at maybe increasing calls, working harder, but rarely did they look at their own strategy. So therefore today is about creating a business development strategy to give us the right tactics to bring additional revenue to expand the vision, expand the business. This also works per consultant as well, so with any individual consultants here, same, same principles apply. So, some expansion methods. There's two expansion methods. Anything you do to expand your business will fall into one of two categories. You're either going to sell your existing service to new companies. It obviously talks about winning new clients. Or, you've got the option to provide new solutions to your existing client base. In order to expand your top line revenue of your business, everything will fall into one of these two categories. So, let's pay attention at the moment to winning new clients. How do we go about winning new clients? Well, let's look at this. What, what are some of the facets of what we might describe as a winning, a successful, a reproductive business development strategy? I'll throw that out there. For some of you that, that run your companies, or have consultants building big numbers, what, what are some of the traits that they have? Any ideas? How would they go about targeting other companies? How would they build their BD lists? Keep on top of the um, relevant market press, just tell stuff's going on, who the moves, moves and shakers and where. Absolutely. So you're saying that research piece becomes a critical to constant research, making sure you're understanding who are the companies out there in the marketplace. What else might a successful recruiter do? Um, they really focus on who they work with. Absolutely. Great. So they're, they're actually taking the time to understand this clearly should be our target market, target companies. What else can we look at? I've got some few ideas here and I've broken it down into categories. First of all, it's critical that you build on your existing success. Now, you could, you could look at a business that has declined or an industry that has declined 30%. There are pockets of success. So therefore, in our businesses, there should be pockets of success. Pinpoint those pockets of success and then we're going to identify why they're successful. First of all, one of the things that we can do is we can look at the competitors of some existing clients. Like I say, focus on the success areas. You can focus on a, a, an area of your business that's declining, targeting the competitors of those declining areas might help you. So focus on the, the, the area it's building. This is, whilst it's so obvious, if you actually did a true litmus test of your business, I'd be interested to see how many of the competitors you're working with of your major customers. It's easier to build credibility, we can network easier, we've got domain expertise, probably got great traction, a great story, we've got relevant candidates, same marketing. It's so logical, but how many businesses actually do it? And therefore there's an action point touching on there. Select your top 5, 10, 50 companies, depending on the size of your business. Research each of those companies. Find the four closest competitors. Are you working or have you pitched to every one of those competitors? If not, this afternoon, that's an immediate point of action that you can, you can bring about further business. Likewise, partners of existing clients. You can use your network to make introductions 
and have great crossover with candidates. It's something that we, in any industry, there's businesses that are closely linked together. Whether that be through personal friendships, whether that be through business relationships, are you tapping into those relationships? Does your client have a partner page, for example? Have you even asked your clients who they're partnered with, who they know? Have you looked on LinkedIn, such a great tool for this, where they previously worked, some of your key customers, some of your key hiring managers? I'm betting they've probably still got great relationships. That might be a target company for you. I think we touched on international. This, to me, is one of the most critical areas and yet really overlooked. The global economy in meltdown, worst, in, uh, worst third global recession for 50 years. The companies most affected, the mature markets. The companies of those, most, uh, of those mature markets that have got most affected, UK, US. Ironically, most of us then stay doing recruitment in the UK market. Whereas when we look at Europe, for example, Europe was still retained an element of strength during the economy. Germany certainly did prove to be really resilient. Salaries in Europe are higher than the UK. Some of you might be really surprised to hear that. Um, the reason that salaries are higher in, in Europe than the UK is simply the pound versus the euro. When the pound was first set, or when the euro was first set up, uh, for example, the pound was worth around 65 to 70 thousand pounds to 100 thousand euros. Now, when I look at that 100 thousand euro salary, that's about 82, 83 thousand pounds. So my net fee income per deal is higher in Europe than it would be in the UK, which is amazing to think because we always think in London maybe they'd have the higher salaries there. I'd obviously, by, by, by working in international locations, I'm providing my clients an end-to-end -end service. But most people put up barriers about uh, working internationally. They, 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 they pinpoint a language barrier. We've made placements in 39 different countries. We've got you know, contractors running in Ivory Coast, Nigeria, a place I never thought that we would do. We haven't, to this day, found any language barriers. We haven't had any multilingual um, consultants in our office. So therefore, I wonder, is that barrier exists? We haven't found that. So I'd urge you to start thinking about those European markets. It's exactly the same as recruiting in London. You identify who to call, you make your canvas call, you then go about identifying candidates. So as an action point, map out the geographic locations of key clients. Are you working with them abroad? Because you can then identify several hiring managers, take with them your existing story, your existing agreement, and that's warm business. So another area to win new clients or to expand our business development portfolio is to think about crossover markets. The most savvy companies, as the economy changed, started to realise that my market's actually doing okay, but there's some periphery markets that are closely connected with what I work with that are expanding rapidly. I'll give you an example as we look at candidates. A recruitment consultant could potentially go down the career path of being an HR consultant. Likewise, they could go down the career path of being direct sales. There's different elements and skill sets that candidates have, so start thinking about where is that crossover? Where else can I sell my, my candidate pool to? So, how do we go about doing this? Have a brainstorm session so you can start to track where some of the candidates that you have in place, where did they go? Why aren't you working with those companies where they ended up going? Because obviously you're working with those candidates, so you're in that pool. <coughs> New hot markets, I think we touched on this at the beginning. This is an absolutely critical element to make sure you are on top of your research. By the way, this goes through every layer of the business. Whether you're a major PLC, uh, running a major PLC, whether you're owner of an SME, whether you're a recruitment consultant, the one thing that I absolutely make sure you do every day is do your market research. Every day. I'm not talking every now and then you take a look. You need to stay on top of the fastest growing trends in your industry, the companies, the individuals, what's happening, and filter that through your business. So, one of the things that we do, we do this every six to 12 months at Consol. I actually had a, a meeting around this yesterday, which is a future market session. So, Get each consultant to present what they see as being a future part of their market. Could be a facet of the market, could be the market overall. They, they, they do the research, they bring ideas to the table. If you get six to eight people in a room suddenly coming on all ideas for where they see the future of their market, 
you'll start to get hints on the future growth of your business and where you can be. And remember we were talking about, we want to be recruiting tomorrow's market today. The only way you can do that is by thinking and researching what is happening tomorrow. Networking is the most obvious area, it's the easiest to do, and it's the number one area that's overlooked. Most consultants don't bother to do it. They don't want to ask their clients, oh, do you know anyone else that's hiring? I'm not sure why, I guess they think it, there's a barrier there, maybe a fear, it's an embarrassing question. That networking piece might be something they haven't learned or haven't been taught. So therefore, urge your consultants and urge your business as a whole to start networking. Ask each client to refer you maybe to one candidate or one, or one company hiring. You'll find that most individuals actually welcome doing that. Actually, it's a great chance for them to share their expertise. If I went up to you guys and I said, oh, do you know a good mechanic? Or do you want to have a good dentist? The amount of people, oh, my dentist is great, my mechanic's great. Why don't you ask your clients? Do you know any good companies out there you think we should be hiring for? Do you know any talented individuals, any maybe friends in your network that are looking for work? Your client will really think that's bad business. In fact, I think that your client will wonder why you hadn't asked sooner. Opportunistic hires. Make sure you're open-minded about um, expanding into new areas, new divisions. Not everyone needs to fit a certain mold for your business. So just make sure you're always open to that aspect. So ensure your recruiting channels know that you're going to look at new markets. Uh, for us at Consol, actually, this was a big, um, big area for success for us. Uh, we had two main divisions. We opportunistically interviewed a recruiter that we thought was exceptional, and he worked a really tiny area of the web development marketplace, the Drupal marketplace. Tiny. We hadn't really heard of it. But it really complemented what we did. We really believed in the individuals, so we hired him. Uh, we became the largest Drupal recruiter in Europe. It's brought about a million pounds in um, gross profit over the last three years. That was a good decision. We built a whole division around that, eight people strong today. We wouldn't have, weren't naturally thinking about that. We just made sure that we were open to it. So make sure you're not accidentally closing yourself off. You've got to take an active interest in your research and strategy. Don't wait, I mean, Kevin touched this perfectly. Don't wait for the market to kick on. Don't wait for your industry to suddenly say we're hiring again. You actually need to take a look, not tactically, with the difference between strategy and tactics, by the way, just to make sure that we're on the same page here. Tactics is about who you're calling, cold calling, hours you're spending on the phone, is your pitch good, are you objection handling? That's your tactics to winning business. Your strategy starts way back and says, are we targeting the right markets for the right reasons? This is an active interest point, and this is where a lot of business owners tend to work on tactics rather than strategy. So I hope that gives you a really solid structure as to all the different ways that you could be building out your business development list. But let's start to think beyond that. How do we separate ourselves from our competition so it's easier said than done? What can we do for our clients beyond sending CVs? I'm going to give you some examples here, some companies that, 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 that we've come across. I don't know if any of you know Pareto Law. Um, Randstad bought them, I think, a, a, a few years back. Pareto Law have done something brilliant in the marketplace because effectively they do a lot of graduate recruitment. And what they realised was, then, let's do graduate recruitment and add some training to that. So they gave graduate recruitment and added sales training to it. So where the previous graduate recruitment fee was three to five thousand pounds, they had sales training to it, they're now charging seven to eight thousand pounds. Close to double fees by doing a couple of days of sales training. That's actually a massive way to separate yourself from your competition, build client loyalty, increase your fees. It was inventive and actually got great market control. One of, we don't really do graduates of consult. Uh, one of the reasons I've started to look a lot more into Pareto Law, one of our key customers that we work with on an exclusive base of senior hires, contacts us, oh, it's absolutely brilliant, you know, I'm amazed by this service, it's really raving about this business. Whereas to me, I think that just grads with a bit of training. But that was a massive value add for the customer. What are you doing that's going to bring that huge value out? How are you going to increase your fees? Another example, I don't know if any of you know a company called Engage Education. Education, really innovative education recruitment company based out of, they've got multiple offices now, but based out of Watford. They created a concept called iDay, career fairs for teachers. 
By the way, they dominate that. No other recruiter gets to, gets to go to this career fairs. So they bring teachers in from all around the world and they hold a career fair days where t schools go and they make offers to teachers on the day. They're guaranteeing themselves a return. They're guaranteeing themselves placement. What a sales pitch. A school has never heard of this. You go in and say, I'd like to invite you to a career fair day we're running. These are all the schools involved. A great way to separate yourself. And by the way, how great is that to negotiate fees? They're coming to this massive uh, structure with so much competition, other schools there. It's innovative, it's unique. The one thing they're not getting is that heavy downward pressure on fees that typically associates in that education market. At Consob, I built my recruitment career off the back of international campaign recruitment. So what that means is, where I was working with companies that were struggling to find staff, uh, effectively what we do is take them and say, staff might not exist in the UK or the US, they might exist globally, and therefore we take clients on mass hiring campaigns around the world. That might be going to locations such as India or Africa for two, three weeks at a time, having multiple interviews, so they can hire five to 50 people. High fees, massive value add for our customer base, retain the business, great element for separating ourselves. By the way, new economy is quite funny because we have the sales pitch of we do campaign recruitment for companies looking for five to fifty people. When the economy changed, you get obviously everyone saying, Oh, you must be you must be dying right now. Who's, no one's hiring five to fifty people. Of which it was a great sales pitch. Really? I'm I'm really surprised, they're actually growing rapidly. Because your competitors they're actually still hiring. Although they've announced the hiring freeze, they're still hiring salespeople. They're taking market share. They realise that their competitors aren't hiring, it's their chance to get the best talent in the marketplace. And suddenly, from a concept where you must be really struggling, you're actually then getting thought-provoking, talking to C-level individuals about why and how they can expand their business. Again, great way to separate ourselves. One of the reasons we stayed ahead of the curve in the economy is we pitched for that big business, we settled for give us one role exclusive then. And that works for us. As opposed to going in and saying, do you have any roles? We've just set up um, a part of our business called CSERV. This was uh, our effort to build a purely alternative revenue stream. To make sure what, what, what I mean or touch by that. CSERV is professional services, they do IT services. Effectively, recruitment companies, they will find maybe permanent staff or contractors. One of the things they won't do is take ownership of the whole project themselves. There's a limit to the service that we can provide as a recruitment company. So what we did was we opened that up. By having a professional services company, it gives us a chance we're hearing projects happening. We can pitch those projects as a professional services company and as a recruitment company. We can offer them like varying degrees of our service. And that brings about a revenue stream that we might not have got. If the customer went with the project's approach, then at least we've got an offering for that. And it's this area around building alternative revenue streams, thinking about how you're going to increase your margins, what you're going to do differently, separating yourself from your competition that we're going to touch on a little bit further now. This could be, by the way, value-added services, <coughs> chargeable services, or increasing fees. <coughs> so we're going to break out into groups. And what we're going to do is generate three ideas per group. Top three ideas. It could be a cross-section that applies to recruitment as a whole. It could be a cross-section that applies to your business, individuals, businesses, or even those in the room. One of the things I like about breaking out into groups is, surprisingly, it's the outsiders that will come up with the ideas for your business. <coughs> because what we tend to do with our business, myself included, is you put barriers around it. I know my market. I know my business. Well, therefore, when you have a stranger come in and say, why don't you do X? Sometimes that could be the difference between being highly successful or not. Uh, I've got a couple of examples of this. You know, and examples that we've seen were payroll solutions. A lot of companies, recruitment companies, offer payroll solutions. Um, they might charge anything from two or ten percent. Great way of creating additional revenue. Um, one idea that didn't work, um, and for those of you who've been recruiting a while, this came out probably around 15 years ago, was the CV writing. And we're going to help candidates writing their CVs and you know, really give them expert end-to-end -end service and <coughs> might charge them £100 to do that. That never really worked. I don't really know many or any recruitment companies today offering a CV writing service. So do think about, if you're going to look at alternative revenue streams, where's that money coming from? Who's going to pay for it? 
are they realistically going to pay? So start thinking about the challenges around that.